Hey yo, what's going on, y'all? It's your man Supreme, and welcome back to the Real Rap Show. And this is episode 63 of the Real Rap Show, the story of Harlem's legendary rooftop nightclub. Now, before we get this episode started, I would like to say thank you to everyone that has been tuning into the Real Rap Show since day one. Everyone in the comments section and also everyone that gives me great feedback about the show. We also reached over 100,000 subscribers on The Real Rap Show. So once again, I would like to thank all the new subscribers and everyone for their support. Don't forget to hit that notification bell so y'all can stay notified whenever I drop a new episode of The Real Rap Show. Now let's get this started. In the mid 1970s, the rooftop was a disco slash skating rink that people in Harlem came to to skate and to party. But inside the rooftop, they had a gambling table. Now, if you are from the hood, I know you are familiar with what we call in the hood the gambling spot. You know what I'm saying? And at the gambling spot, dudes that are the top hustlers, drug dealers, pimps, you know, all the people involved with the underworld, that's where they come to, you know, gamble. And like I said, if you're from the hood, you are very familiar with what happens in the gambling spot and outside the gambling spot. Gambling spots is real popular. A lot of bad things go down at the gambling spot. But let's get back to the rooftop. The rooftop had a gambling table in there. And at the time, in Harlem, Gambling was real popular. So the rooftop was a disco and it was a skating rink, but it was more popular because that's where all the top hustlers, the pimps, that's where they came to gamble. It was also a place where you could come in there and drink. It was a known spot where if you were a part of the underworld, you could come in there and sniff cocaine in public like it wasn't nothing. That's what the rooftop was popular and known for in the mid-1970s, late 1970s, my mistake. Before we get into the story, I want to make this very clear. I'm going to speak about real things that took place at the rooftop because in the comments, it's going to be a lot of people from Harlem that's going to come in the comments saying stuff like, yo, you ain't saying it right. That ain't happened. Everything I'm giving y'all in this episode is all facts. Also, in this episode, I am not downing the owner of the rooftop. I'm just speaking on the legendary rooftop nightclub and things that took place there. Let's get into it. Hit the like button. Now, the rooftop was located under the 155th Street Bridge in Harlem directly across the street from Harlem's famous Rucker Park and Harlem's infamous Polo Grounds projects. Now, in around 1979-1980, the rooftop was having financial trouble. Now, this is also around the time when there was a lot of hustlers in Harlem. Now, there was a dude that was a big-time drug dealer in Harlem. I wouldn't say a big-time drug dealer because at that time, there was a lot of dudes in Harlem that you could label big-time drug dealers. Everybody was getting money in the drug game at that time in Harlem. So there was a dude that was getting a lot of money that used to hang out in front of the rooftop. Now, this dude that hung out in front of the rooftop, he knew the dude that owned the rooftop. So I guess he found out that the dude owed a lot of money in rent and that he was about to lose the place. So what this hustler dude outside did was he decided to take his drug money and try to invest it into a business. So what he did was he took some money, gave it to the dude, paid up the back rent, then gave the dude a couple extra thousand for his pocket, and then he took ownership of the rooftop. Now, before I continue... I want to take it back just a bit because I want y'all to get the real history of the rooftop. Like I explained earlier, in the early 70s, mid 70s, the rooftop was a place where prostitutes, drug dealers, pimps, 
hustlers. This was the place where they came to hang out. Also, at that time, there was a lot of violence at the rooftop, inside and outside. People were getting, you know, unalived even back then. So, I said all that to say this. I want you guys to follow the dark cloud that followed the rooftop throughout the years. Let's continue. So now, this dude that now owned the rooftop went by the name of Gusto. Gusto wanted to put some new stuff inside the rooftop. He wanted to give the place kind of like a new look. But he didn't have all the money. He had money, but he now owned a business. And he needed more money to invest into the place. So what he did was, he contacted a friend of his who also was a rising drug dealer in Harlem at that time who went by the name of Alberto Alpo Martinez. Now hit the like button because we're about to get deep. We're going to get back to Alpo in a minute. But Gusto also reached out to one of his OGs. This dude was labeled the godfather of Harlem. And that man was William Brewington. Now William Brewington owned the legendary Woolies Burger. I did a whole story on Woolies Burger. After you watch this video, maybe you should check that video out. But William Brewington kind of helped Gusto learn how to run the business, how to hire people, etc., etc. Now, I want to get deep for a minute because over here on The Real Rap Show, we don't sugarcoat nothing over here. Now, I want to put something in the air about this man, William Brewington, who owned Woolies Burger. Now, not only did he own Woolies Burger, he owned a few more nightclubs, bars, and a couple of more places this guy ran in Harlem. Now, I want to ask y'all a question. Tear the comments up. When somebody is labeling you the godfather, what kind of work is you putting in for niggas to be calling you out of everybody that's out here? At that time, why is they calling you the godfather? And what kind of godfather was this guy? Now, I want y'all to tell me in the comment section because we're going to get deeper. What kind of godfather was he and why was they calling him the godfather? Because he ran mad businesses. I know people that run businesses right now and ain't nobody calling them the godfather. Hit the like button. The godfather of what? Now, let me tell y'all the real deal about this man, William Brewington, and why in Harlem he was the godfather. Now, after doing my research, I come to find out that this man was one of Nicky Barnes' associates. You know what I'm saying? Nicky Barnes was his OG. Nicky Barnes was somebody that was giving him knowledge and he was doing business with Nicky Barnes. So I guess it's safe to say this is how he got the money to start his businesses in Harlem. With what? Drug money. Hit the like button. Now I know people are going to come in the comments, no, trying to keep Mr. Woolley's name clean. But real is real. Anybody that know anyone, and I mean anyone, that was labeled one of Nicky Barnes' associates and you was close enough with Nicky Barnes to where you could be around him because at that time also, Nicky Barnes was like a fucking ghost. Like, nobody saw that nigga. Nigga saw him when he was going to court. That was it. You heard about him. Only people that was able to be around him was his family or whatever. The faculty or whatever he called that shit that he took down. This guy, William Brewington, was one of Nicky Barnes' main associates. So, I mean, like I said before, we don't sugarcoat nothing over here. All the real people listening to me right now know what's up. It's nothing wrong with y'all trying to uh, keep Mr. Woolley's name clean. But once again, at that time, anybody that was dealing with Nicky Barnes was getting drugs from him. That was it. Now, whatever you did with the drugs, you did with the money, you opened up businesses, that's cool. But on the real rap show, we putting it out there. The man who owned Woolies Burger was selling dope for Nicky Barnes. 
but he was smarter with his money. You feel me? All the other people was running around buying cars and fur coats and all that. This man decided to save his bread and open up businesses. Now, we're not knocking him for doing that. Jay-Z even said he was on the block before he became who we see now. It's nothing wrong with it. Because I know the people are going to come in the comments. You talking about Mr. Wooly like that. It is what it is. I'm giving the facts here like I said in the beginning. It's nothing wrong with the real being told. The man that opened up Wooly's Burger. The man that Gusto went to and said, yo, how you do this shit? Was selling dope for Nicky Barnes, man. This is why Gusto ran right to him. Yo, how you do this shit? So now that Gusto has gotten the blueprint from the godfather of opening up businesses, and uh, once again, I've never heard of a godfather of opening up businesses. Y'all let me know in the comment section in your city, have you ever heard of the godfather of opening up businesses? <laughs> Y'all let me know in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, pardon me, y'all, but um, back to the story. So now that Gusto has gotten the blueprint on how to hire people, you know, run the cash register, you know, do paperwork, et cetera, et cetera. Now that he has gotten the blueprint from uh, William Brewington, the godfather, now the rooftop is on its way to becoming what it became. The Rooftop was a success as far as business. They had the best DJs playing inside the Rooftop. They had DJs like Kid Capri, Star Ski, Legendary Brucey B. And the music that was out at that time that they was rocking inside the Rooftop was like the soundtrack to the streets, man. And years later, Kid Capri dropped an album or a mixtape titled soundtrack to the streets and that's what those djs music was to harlem and to the rooftop it was the soundtrack to the streets and at that time the streets of harlem new york period the crack era it was the wild west man so when i say the soundtrack to the streets imagine everything that came with that it was going into the mid 80s and the rooftop was the talk of New York, man. This is also the time legendary drug dealers in Harlem was at their peak. Alpo was one of those dudes, Rich Porter, AZ, and a few others. But we're going to speak about Alpo and his connection to the rooftop once again. Now, a lot of people have heard stories about some of the things that Alpo was getting away with inside the rooftop. We've heard the stories about him having X-rated movies played inside the rooftop while there was a party going on. I mean, in front of everybody. They would put on an X-rated movie of Alpo and the girlfriend of one of his enemies or uh, someone he didn't like. Alpo would go and give these girls money and then record them in the bed with him and then... To get their boyfriends mad or whatever he was trying to do, he would then take the videotape to the rooftop on a night that it was crowded with people and have the tape played inside the club. I think there also were times where the girl that was in the video was inside the club and he would humiliate people on several occasions where guys that he didn't like would have birthday parties inside the rooftop. Alpo would show up and take the birthday cake and smash the birthday cake in the guy's face in front of his friends and family. And everybody was scared to death of this guy. There was a lot of things that Alpo did to people inside the rooftop that we never even heard about. People want to know how did or how was Alpo able to get away with some of those things. I mean, if you tried that in a nightclub today, the security would beat flames out you, you know what I'm saying? Or you would get kicked out the club. Or you might get jumped by the people inside the club. You feel me? You're not doing that today. So back then, people were so afraid of Alpo that 
he would show up to these events at the rooftop and humiliate whoever the party was for. And nobody would do anything. So a lot of people never spoke about how he was able to get away with these things. When this guy Gusto opened up the rooftop, Alpo invested money into it to help him get it going. You feel me? I mean, I don't know if, I mean, he probably was paying Alpo because if the man gave you bread to help start the rooftop and it became a success, I'm pretty sure that Alpo was getting paid, you know, periodically. You know what I'm saying? Whether it was weekly or monthly, Alpo was getting money in the rooftop. You feel me? That's how he was able to walk in there, pass security, come inside there with guns on him and do stuff to people like that because he was a low-key silent partner in the rooftop. And, I mean, I'm not trying to be the icebreaker or nothing like that, but a lot of people that have heard stories about what Al Poe was doing inside the rooftop Always wanted to know how was this man able to walk inside this nightclub and manhandle people like this. It's because he was part owner of the rooftop. Hit the like button. Now, a lot of people don't know this, but producer and member of the R&B group guy, Teddy Riley, got his start at the rooftop. Actually, Teddy Riley was at the rooftop in the early days when Gusto first got it. Yo, it got to a point where outside the rooftop was better than being inside the rooftop because outside was a fashion and car show. Every drug dealer in the tri-state area wanted to come to the rooftop just to front. You seen rich drug dealers with the flyest girls. The best cars would be out there. I mean, dudes was pulling up in Mercedes Benzes, BMWs, Volkswagens, Saabs, Jeeps, Corvettes. You seen dudes pulling up in Ferraris, Porsches. You even seen women drug dealers and women that was big time hustlers pulling up with their homegirls in Benzes, BMWs, just like the dudes wearing big rope chains, hopping out with the big door knockers, Gucci jackets. Ask anybody that was outside that rooftop, man, and they will tell you that shit was a motion picture, man. Now, check this out. Do y'all remember that scene from the movie Paid in Full when AZ was outside the rooftop that night and that light-skinned fed dude walked up to him and he was like, yo, I ain't mean to come up on you last time the wrong way, but you know, I want to do business. Well... That is exactly how it was outside the rooftop. You had the feds out there disguised as drug dealers selling niggas coke. Ask anybody that was there and they will tell you that it was exactly like that. It was so many niggas out there from different parts of New York City that was the top drug dealers that was coming to the rooftop just to front and show their cars. Niggas would pop the trunk and they would have 10, 15 bricks of coke in the trunk of their car. A lot of deals was made outside that rooftop too. And the feds was coming up to the rooftop driving Benzes, Porsches, Lamborghinis, all that, wearing jewelry, disguised as drug dealers. And they was out there building cases on niggas. You can also ask anybody again from that era and they will tell you that a lot of niggas went to jail and got cases builded on them that put them in the penitentiary for 25 and 30 years just for coming up to the rooftop. The police was coming up there selling niggas drugs and it was a lot of dumb niggas outside the rooftop that had cars and trunks full of money Niggas wanted the front for the girls that was out there. So if a nigga walked up to you and said, yo, I'm out of D.C., uh, I heard a lot about you, you know what I mean? I got it popping out there in D.C. Niggas was stupid enough to go, here, take my number, and the Fed would go, yo, well, I got 10 bricks in the trunk right now. And niggas was, word, and niggas was buying the drugs 
from the feds right there on the spot. The feds had niggas on camera. Niggas was wearing wires. When you look at the rooftop, and I'm not being funny by what I'm about to say, but a lot of people is going to laugh at this. And this is all facts. When you look at old nightclubs like Studio 54, the Palladium, all those old disco clubs, even the Tunnel nightclub, you can Google it and pull up pictures and maybe even some video from those parties. There is video from Studio 54 on YouTube. But when you try to pull up pictures or videos from inside the rooftop, you ain't going to find none. I'm going to explain to y'all why. It goes to show you how much dirt was being done inside that place. Now, don't get me wrong. It's a couple of people that was up there, a couple of dealers, Al Poor and them cats that went up there and took pictures. We have seen pictures from people that was there. But for the rooftop to be in Harlem in the 80s, when I can say cameras and, you know, media was not really taken off like that, but it was cameras and people in the clubs doing videos and stuff like that. Like I said, you can pull up videos from Studio 54 where big time celebrities, Michael Jackson, Diana Ross, that was in there sniffing coke. The coke was on the table in the pictures. You can pull it up and see it on the internet. It's crazy how it ain't that many pictures from the rooftop. I saw one video and the video looked it so bad. I said, yo, what the hell is this? But real talk, I'm going to say it again because there are people that are going to come and go, yo, nah, it's mad pictures that was taken in the rooftop. Get the fuck out of here. You want to know who got all the good pictures from the rooftop inside and outside? The fucking feds. The feds got the best pictures and the best videos of the rooftop, inside and outside. It does kind of raise a flag why you can pull up videos from disco clubs from the 70s when they was in there sniffing boy in front of the camera. And in Harlem at that time, you can say damn near crack was legal. It was so many people selling crack, it looked it like the shit was legal. Niggas, like I said, niggas was at the rooftop with bricks in their trunk. Niggas was doing it like that. It was dudes getting pulled over by the police. And the police didn't even pop the trunk. And niggas would have 30 keys in the trunk. Hey, yo, real talk. Like I said, y'all, the feds would drive by the rooftop and do a drive-by photo shoot. I mean, they would literally drive by the rooftop. A fed would roll the window down and stick his head out the window with a camera in his hand with everybody looking at him doing this and start snapping pictures of everyone that they were building a case on. And I'm going to say this again. It was a lot of stupid, obnoxious dudes out there because these feds would spin the block three and four times and just keep snapping pictures. And it was dudes, I don't know if they thought that was a record label looking for rappers but it was like dudes wanted to be in the limelight so bad that they would literally be posing for the pictures that the feds was driving by taking. And people knew, like, why do why that car keep driving by here taking? And instead of dudes packing up and leaving, the police would spin the block and it would be more niggas out there. It would be niggas out there popping champagne. You would see niggas out there with dice games where the bank is ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars, man. And the feds would have all this shit on camera, recorded and pictures. So I'm gonna say it again. If you wanna know where you can find the best legendary iconic pictures from the rooftop, holler at the feds. Hit the like button. Now, this man Gusto, that was the owner of the rooftop, was getting a lot of money in Harlem. You know what I'm saying? Like I said, the rooftop was a fucking success. Everybody was coming up there. Rappers, like I said, the feds, they was out there partying, popping bottles. It was everything 
I described to y'all. Now, this man used to be a drug dealer. Now, he got this popular club. He getting all this money. It's celebrities there every other night. He can have any woman in Harlem that he wants. And uh, the dudes that he used to hustle with got jealous. And I guess they felt like, yo, we can get this dude. So one day, two or three dudes shows up to the rooftop pretending as if they want to throw a party at the club. So they like, yo, we want to book the club. Can we talk to the owner? So whoever they told that to went and got Gusto. Gusto came. And soon as Gusto got before the dudes, these dudes backed out three guns. So now they got everybody at gunpoint. Teddy Riley was there. I think they hit one of the guys in the head with a 50 cal. So everybody is scared. These dudes is demanding money. So Gusto tells the dudes, yo, don't hurt nobody. It ain't no money inside the club. So it kind of played out like how they had AZ in that crib in the Bronx and paid in full. You know what I'm saying? Because AZ told the stick up kids, yo, it ain't no money inside the safe. I got 200000 at the crib. Take me to my crib. But it was the same thing with this dude, Gusto. He told the gunman, yo, it ain't no money inside the club. He said, don't hurt nobody. I'll take you to where the money is at. Now, these dudes believed him and put him inside of a car at gunpoint. And he took them to where the money was at. But he was smart because... He didn't take them to the crib where the real stash was at. The crib he did take them to had a small amount of money there. So when they get him to the crib, now this way the story gets a little twisted because people is going to come in the comments and say that what I'm saying right now is wrong. But Harlem, tear the comment section up. Now, these dudes get him to this crib where the money is at. Now, I'm not sure if he gave these guys the money or not because when he got in the crib with these guys, somehow he happened to jump out the motherfucking window from the fifth floor and survived it. I think they said he had a broken hip or a broken leg or something like that. He was injured. When you scared like that, your adrenaline is rushing. This man jumped out the motherfucking window, man on some Superman shit and survived it. You know what I'm saying? Now, like I said, I'm not sure if these guys got the money and was like, yo, where the rest of the money at? And started beating this dude up in the crib. And in the process, he happened to shake away and jump out the fucking window. He said that he didn't jump out the window. So I'm going to ask y'all again. Harlem, tear the comment section up. Now remember... That was Alpo's club too. Now, I heard that Alpo ended up catching up with one of the dudes that robbed Gusto. And Alpo blew the nigga head off. Yo, there was so much shit going on at the rooftop because you got Polo Grounds projects right across the street. Then you got the legendary Rucker Park right across the street from the projects. So, there was so many robberies. The stick-up kids would just sit inside Rucker Park in the dark spot and just catch all the out-of-town niggas. Because all you had to do was look at the plates on the car. Oh, that nigga from Jersey, that nigga from Delaware, that nigga from CT. Because like I said, you had niggas that was getting money, but they was clown niggas coming up to the rooftop to bag bitches, to front, to show their jewelry. Those was the niggas that was getting robbed. And then you had niggas from Polo Grounds Projects that would rob niggas and go back upstairs, change clothes, come back out, rob another nigga, go back upstairs. I mean, it was ridiculous out there outside that rooftop, man. Then in 1989, two dudes got bodied and a girl got hit as well. Then after that, or it could have been before that, legendary upcoming drug dealer, L.A. got bodied at the rooftop. Like I said, man, it was so many good people getting murdered up there. You know what I mean? In 89, when they killed L.A., that's when 
because people in Harlem loved this dude L.A. so much. He was kind of like a rich porter before rich porter. You feel me? Um, I'm going to do a story on him soon, too. Um, a lot of people have been asking me about him. When he got killed at the rooftop, it went through Harlem so crazy because so many people loved this dude. And when they lost him at the rooftop, that's when Harlem said, all right, that's it. You know what I'm saying? And uh, in 1989, uh, the rooftop closed down. So I definitely want to say rest in peace to everybody that lost their life at the rooftop. You know what I'm saying? But um, I want to know from the people, did you ever attend the rooftop? Was you a regular at the rooftop? And if you was, what were some of the things that you seen happen at the rooftop? Do y'all think the rooftop should have stayed open or should the rooftop have closed down? And also, did you ever get robbed at the rooftop? Thank you for watching. It's your man Supreme. And you were just tuned in to another episode of The Real Rap Show. And this was episode 63 of The Real Rap Show. The story of Harlem's legendary rooftop nightclub and skating rink. Give this video a like and subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to hit that notification bell so y'all can stay notified whenever I drop a new episode of The Real Rap Show. Y'all stay safe out there. Real rap.